of our struggle, singing every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child. Every good thing is born of a struggle, singing every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child, my child. And I wouldn't leave you in this heartache if it was all for nothing. Wouldn't leave you in this struggle if I didn't see something being born in you. So beautiful and so true, like a statue of David chiseled away and never faint. There's a new child rising, new life shining in your face, in your pain, in your everything. If you only knew, child, what I see in you, child, I think you wanted to. But I'm proud of you, child, as you struggle through. Yes, I'm proud of you, child, as you struggle through. Of a struggle, singing every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child. Sing with me now. So, like, if I buy a robe like his and wear it every Sunday, is that cool? It would just save me a lot of decisions <laughs> and a lot of money. Coolest monks, I say it every week, almost coolest monks I've ever seen. <laughs> well, we're into the subject today in a series of struggling. Uh, are struggling financially. And of course, because of COVID, many people have um, experienced some things that would have been never possible before. You know, we, we experienced job losses, career shutdowns, lots of businesses shut down. And it's not an unusual thing for people to feel like, man, we are under so much financial pressure. Everything seems so uncertain. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what the future holds. So it's likely, it's highly likely that some of us in here, and now there's the additional complication where some jobs are saying that, you know, if you are not vaccinated, you're not going to be able to keep your job. And this brings tremendous pressure and decisions on people because some people that are younger or for whatever reason, they just don't want to be vaccinated. And so they are faced with this issue of losing their job, potentially their career, or taking a vaccination that they don't want to take. So there's, there's all these pressures that we've experienced in the past 18 months two years financial pressures because of covid but you can experience financial pressures at any time in life now here's the thing that i know i want to start out by saying this there is really really some good news that i'm going to share with everybody here today and the good news is this financial pressure i'm I'm not minimizing that financial changes don't occur that financial jolts don't occur and that these things hurt okay i don't want to make small i don't want to be insensitive they hurt they shake us they jolt us okay so i'm I'm all about that i understand i'd be the same way okay but here's what i also know i know that the thing we call struggle that results from financial changes we'll just call it changes things occur that we wish would not occur The thing that we feel internally that we call struggle, it's something that God is going to tell us today in his word. We not only have control over it, it's completely unnecessary. You say, Randy, come on, you know, I'd like to see how you'd react if all of a sudden, you know, your career was lost. You couldn't make a livelihood. I can tell you how I'd react. I'd be shaken to the core. I'd probably cry. And then I can tell you what else I would do. I've walked with the Lord a long time now. I've walked through life a long time. I would ultimately, because I know God, I would ultimately calm myself down, remind myself of who I have put my trust in, and remind myself of the truth about God and the truth about life, and I would talk myself down off that ledge and I would walk through it. And, and I'm telling you, folks, I've done this numerous times. I have to do it on a pretty regular basis, talk myself down off the ledge by taking God's truth, reminding myself who I've trusted and what I believe because of what he says in his word. How many know what I'm talking about when I say talking yourself down off the ledge? You remind yourself of God's truth. So our emotions are like going like wild, okay? They, they want to just sweep us away, but... We hit that pause button, and we start saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know who I've put my trust in, and I know that he created this universe, and he loved me enough to die for me. I can trust him. And so even though I'm scared, even though I'm shaken, even though I'm confused, 
I'm going to trust him. And now let, let, me, let me go back. What, what does he say to me in his word about the circumstance, the situation that I'm facing now? And that's how we talk ourselves down to the ledge. So here's the thing. As this COVID period has come and it's still ensuing to some degree and it's causing all kinds of shakeups financially, here's the truth. Some of us have navigated them and have navigated them well. We didn't like it. We don't like what's going on. We, we didn't enjoy the feelings. But nevertheless, we talked ourselves by God's truth down off the ledge. We, we navigated through it, and we're okay. We're okay. Maybe we had to take a step back, which it seems like almost un-American, right? Because we always want to be taking steps forward as Americans. We want to be growing. We want to be expanding. But the truth is, sometimes in life, our Father in heaven assigns us to take a step back in the way that we live, lifestyle, financial income, and so forth. But nevertheless, some of us have negotiated it, and we're okay. And then some of us, we're, we're still struggling. We're still stressed out. Now, part of it might have to do with where you live, what state you live in. Uh, there was a study done recently, and, and here's just a couple results. Utah is the happiest state of all the 50 states. Maryland ranked pretty darn good, number eight. And West Virginia <laughs> was last. But don't misunderstand that. They're clever. They're saying, oh, it's awful to live here. Don't, don't come to West Virginia. <laughs> no, 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 you'd hate it here. You'd hate it here. <laughs> They're clever. Now, Utah, Utah, I have a theory on why Utah is the happiest state. Utah is made up of 65% Mormons. Now, you probably don't know anything about Mormons. You don't need to know anything about Mormons. They were founded by a false prophet named Joseph Smith. Randy, are you saying that all Mormons are not Christians? No, there are some Mormons that are Christians, not because of what their church teaches, but in spite of what their church teaches, because they were founded by a false prophet named Joseph Smith. Nevertheless, the Mormons, 65% of the state of Utah is Mormons, and they have a secret. They have magic underwear. <laughs> they do. They do. You're like, what are you talking about, Randy? Look it up online. They've got magic underwear. I'm not so sure, but that might be what makes them so happy. Not sure. You got to be a Mormon to wear the underwear, to get the underwear. But anyway, so for the rest of us, though, it's been looking kind of like this. If I could go to my next slide. 70% of Americans report feeling anxious about their financial situation. That's likely the same that we feel in here. Probably 77% of us feel just a little unsure, you know, at least. 58% feel that finances control their lives. It's likely true for some of us in here. And then 52% have difficulty controlling their money-related worries. Now, there is one truth that we have to start with. Sometimes the financial struggles we feel are simply because, now this, this, is, this is deep, so you gotta, you gotta get, get yourself ready for this. But sometimes it's simply because we want to spend more than we make. That's it, that's it. Now, I could do a whole nother message sometime about if you find yourself wanting to spend more than you make, I could do a whole nother message sometime because it takes some unpacking a deep spiritual psychological stuff to get to the root of it. Or I could give you the short version of it now. If you happen to be one of the people that you have financial struggles because you want to spend more than you make, I can give you a short version now. I can't give you the whole message. How, you, you up for the short version? Anybody want the short version? Just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop spending more than you make. Just stop it. There it is. And join Financial Peace University. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We've had so many people that uh, have been in debt all their lives, and within a couple of years, Financial Peace University, no matter how in debt you are, it will show you how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, and so forth. So all kidding aside, if you are struggling and you just can't figure out, man, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of debt, it's worth the time. Take Financial Peace University. Okay. So... Struggling financially, the truth is sometimes we struggle because of what's going on up here. It's not the circumstance because you could have two 
Christians, two people that have put their trust in Christ and are following him, one goes through a financial twist or turn and they struggle financially. They, they are in a state of panic more or less. You have another Christian, they might feel the jolt, they might go through the panic, but like I said, they talked yourself down off the ledge. What is the difference? Now I'm gonna focus in on just two things today and these two things will likely, for someone that takes these in, likely change the way that you react toward financial pressures, struggles for the rest of your life. It, it is certainly possible that, that God wants to release some of us this morning from something that we haven't been able to untangle ourselves from throughout our whole life. So let's start by this. We have to do one thing, recognizing and replacing misplaced trust. You see, I believe, and Scripture teaches, that many times the reason <clears throat> that we struggle financially, in other words, we, we feel uncomfortable about financial pressures and uncertainties, is because we have misplaced our trust. Our trust is not in Christ. It's not in a heavenly Father. It's either in our own ability to make things happen or in other human ideas and institutions or, or our trust is in money itself. It's in my 401k, you know, it's in my, my stocks or bonds or, or whatever it is or my gold. How many of you know you can't eat gold? Can I see your hands? When you get hungry, try, I'm telling you, I don't care how much gold you got piled up. It will, you'll starve to death with that gold piled up. How many of you know that? It's, it's important you know that. How many of you know there's a book of James warns people living in the last days not to pile up gold? How many of you knew that? You need to watch that. Can't eat gold. All right, not another message. Let me go back. So, so listen to the words of Jesus, and you'll see where I'm going with this, recognizing and replacing uh, our, our trust. Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, so do not, what's the word? Worry. worry. Financial struggles are a form typically of worry we we feel that uncomfortable feeling inside we worry we're like man i don't know if i'm going to survive i don't know if i'm going to have enough i, I want to make sure that i'm just going to have enough to the end of my life which is kind of a, an absurd way to live but it's the way so many of us do so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans not the motorcycle gang for the pagans run after <laughs> run after all these things they might worry about it too i don't know for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you what so here we see the start of the problem some human beings live as though they're on their own they're they're just orphans We're, we don't have a heavenly father just curious how many of you in here uh, have had children and you went through that stage with the kids where they were in the crib but every time you, you would leave the room they start screaming and crying and to the point of exhaustion and so you know you need to make that break with them where you know you're going to be able to walk out of their room and the child is going to relax and go to sleep and, and maybe what you do is uh, you, you step out of the room, but you're right there on the other side of the doorway. You're out of sight of the child because you know you can't let the child see you. And the child is just crying and screaming, and it goes on and on and on, and your heart's breaking. You feel so awful. You want to rush in there. You want to grab a child. But you know, you know that child has to learn that they are safe even though they can't see you. How, how many have ever gone through that with a child? It's, it's really rough. It's hard. We can't see the Heavenly Father, but does that mean He's not there? We can't see the Heavenly Father, but does that mean that He doesn't care? He, he expressed His care in Christ, going all the way to the cross to express the depths of His love for us. If He created us for Himself and loves us enough to sacrificially give Himself, doesn't it make sense that he will at least provide us what we need as long as we need it? Now, how many of you know that you, you're not going to live forever on this life? You're, you're sooner or later, you're on your way out of here, okay? We're, we're, from the moment you're born, you're on your way out of here. We just don't know when we're on our way out of here. We hope it's going to be longer than, than short, but we don't know. 
So doesn't it make sense that a heavenly father that is good and loving and tender would see to it that we have what we need as long as long as we're here? That, that, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the pagans, they, they run after all these things. They're worried. They're, they're concerned. They have financial struggles because they're worried. I don't know if I'm going to have enough. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I, I mean, what, what, am I gonna, what am I going to do when I retire? What, what about this? What about that? What about the what abouts are resolved if we really trust that we have a heavenly father sometimes i think it must look to god like you know we're we're the ki- we're the weird kid in a rich family you know the father is extraordinarily wealthy he owns multiple businesses and he's extraordinary kind and generous and yet the one child in the family hoards all their food away and and doesn't give a cookie to any other kid is extremely stingy always fearful that they're going to be thrown out of the house and yet the father loves the kid the kid is safe and secure and could give away tons of things that they have and the father would gladly supply them with more in fact the father wants them to be secure and generous and count on the generosity of the father but yet the child is scared and insecure and it all revolves around untrusting M- misplaced trust i'm gonna just say it some of us in here likely right now are struggling financially not because of the circumstances circumstances are always going to change we we can't control the circumstances in our better moments we know that circumstances are always going to be uncertain they've always been uncertain throughout human history but the reason that some of us are struggling financially it's it's in here it's in here misplaced trust instead of trusting in christ instead of trusting in the father we're trusting in either our own abilities to take care of ourselves, or some other human constructs there that are existing to take care of us and consequently we're scared we're struggling we're worried we're in that group that we read about that 77 percent of people that are that are struggling financially right now now let's go on this verse extends or this passage extends so jesus goes on this is still in matthew 25 he says you've got this father you know so why are you worried why are you worried about these things but he says here's what to do he says instead of worrying about your financial needs instead of worrying about whether you're going to have enough he says but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness what what is he saying look 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 look. instead of worrying about are you going to have enough just focus on the kingdom of god god is building his kingdom jesus is building his church it is built person by person as each new person comes to put their trust in christ and become his follower the kingdom of god is expanded the church the called out assembly of christ is expanded and you and i are the builders and so here's jesus saying instead of worrying about your stuff and are you going to have enough he says man you need to concentrate on something else you you need to trust in the father and then you need to focus on participating in the expansion of the kingdom of god and don't stop there says jesus the next thing you need to concentrate on is his righteousness he's saying our character development he's saying instead of focusing on you're going to have enough stuff focus on are, are you becoming more like more like god are are you loving more like him are you becoming more righteous are you are you putting out of your life the things that god says are destructive that he calls sin are are we growing he says focus on development focus on growth and then the good news and all these things what does it say say it with me now the all these things are the things that he said the pagans were worried about man are we going to have enough what are we going to eat what are we going to drink are we going to have shelter are we going to make it are we going to survive i need to know i have enough until my my last breath which again is an absurd way to live and jesus says just don't even worry about it he said that remember he said stop worrying financial struggles often are nothing more than our worries because of misplaced trust we have a hard time because the father is not visible we're like the little baby screaming because we no longer see the parent standing there 
and yet he says i'm here you'll see it you can trust me don't even think about it you say randy are you kidding me i just had my business closed down i don't know what i'm going to do for the rest of my life i just lost my career randy you're telling me don't worry about it no i'm not i'm not saying be foolish and irrational and not plan god wants us to use the wisdom and the the understanding that he's given to us but but can't god reassign us can't he we talked about this in last week's message can't he say your time for this is over i want to i want to reassign you somewhere instead of worrying just say okay god it's a new adventure don't like it i don't like this adventure god but i'll take it with you i'll trust you you see that's our options jesus says don't worry he says all this will be given you jesus is promising that we'll have the things that we're worried that we won't have you say randy are you saying that then that 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 i'm guaranteed by god that i can keep the lifestyle that i have that i'm comfortable with (laughs) i didn't say that i didn't say that i just said that he promises that he'll provide what he sees that we need now we're going to zero in on this later on in the message we're we're going to see what god thinks we need and we'll have to compare it We'll have to compare it with what we think we need because sometimes those things don't match up and that causes us to have financial struggles too. He says, this will be given to you for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Now, earlier in this passage, Jesus said, don't go trying to accumulate treasure on earth. He says, if you try to accumulate treasure on earth, all the stuff, it's, it's disintegrates. It doesn't last. He says, moths eat it and rust eats it up. He says, and then thieves break in and steal. He says, instead of trying to accumulate things on earth, he says, don't do it because they don't last and they are never secure. Thieves break in and steal. How many of you ever had a thief break in and steal something from your house? Can I see your, see your hand? That's a lot of people. That's why we have locks on doors and things. So Jesus says, trying to accumulate wealth on earth he says that's going to cause more worry and he says and it's futile because the stuff that you're working for it's only going to last for a short period of time and it's never going to be secure because there's all kinds of things that can happen wars can happen crimes can happen economic downturns can happen your health can fail there's so many things that can happen he says you can do that he says if you want to you can give your whole life to amassing wealth on earth he says but i'd like you not to do that he says instead he says instead of accumulating wealth on earth he says lay up accumulate wealth he says you can read it on your own in matthew 6 the rest of the passage he says lay up treasure in heaven well, how do you do that? Well, you have to ask the question, what can make the transition from earth to heaven? In other words, when you leave this dimension, what can be transferred to heaven? Because Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven. Well, how do you do that? Can you, can you, can you take your money and mail it to heaven? Is there a postal box, a P.O. box? I mean, what is he talking about well in luke 16 he talks specifically he says take worldly wealth and make friends for yourselves that will ask you to come into their everlasting dwellings jesus is saying the way you lay up treasure on earth is we take the wealth that we do have and we invest it in the kingdom of god in the reaching of other people and then the teaching of those people to be the human beings that god designed them to be that's how we lay up treasure in heaven so jesus says where your treasure is where your treasure is what does it say there will your heart be also how many would admit to something if you look out the window and you see some kids playing ball they got a hard ball they're throwing it back and forth back and forth and and they've got a cars right behind them and you know watching them if one kid misses somebody's getting a, a window broken okay so you're watching you're throwing the ball harder and harder and faster and faster but it's not your car it's not your car it's there it's the neighbor's car okay (laughs) then you you might be concerned but would you be more concerned if it was your car how many would say if it was my car i I, i'd be i'd be putting my clothes on i'm going outside (laughs) no up the street how many how many would acknowledge you would can i say because it's your treasure it's your treasure it has your heart jesus was saying 
where we invest our heart follows like a magnet you want to see your love for God your love for people your love for church your love for the kingdom of God your love for seeing people reach for Christ and then taught up in Christ you want to see that grow Jesus says invest in it that's his suggestion so seek first the kingdom of God everything else the things that we worry about that we won't have enough of till the end of life he says I promise you you'll have what you need and then he says but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven let's go on now Jesus adds this this is this is really interesting he says no one can serve two masters this is all in the same passage in Matthew 6 no one can serve two masters either he will hate the one and what is the word love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both God and what but you can serve God with your money this is true we can't serve God in money but we can serve God with our money now why why does Jesus say these are exclusive why can't you serve God and money I mean I didn't write it Jesus did he said it's an impossibility why would that be impossible let me let me explain to you what's behind this how many of you think that people would know who bill gates is if he were not wealthy can i see your hands i mean do we know who bill gates is because of the cool haircut that he has <laughs> i don't think so no 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 we know we all everybody in this room knows who bill gates is why because my man is loaded with money 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 he has more money he knows what to do with what does this teach us money can give to human beings a sense of significance and value money is a suitor it is a competitor with God because money will cause us to worship it without even knowing he said Rand I don't worship money if you or I knowingly or unknowingly derive our sense of significance from our money our sense of security security from our money or our satisfaction our prime satisfaction in life from what money can buy then knowingly or unknowingly we are likely worshiping money you see we're supposed to get our sense of significance from God he cre Christ created me and he died for me that's what gives me my worth that's what gives me my self esteem it's meant to give you yours that's untouchable my security comes from Christ I am here you are here if you're a follower of Jesus you I don't want you to be presumptuous and, and crazy now but, but I'm going to tell you the secret here the truth is you are totally indestructible until God's mission for you on this earth is up you mean Randy I can stand in front of a train and, and I'm going to be indestructible no you're, you're a fool to think that way don't think that way <laughs> but I mean it your security is you are indestructible until God's time for you. Your times are in God's hand, the scripture says. Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them, who can finish it for me? I give them what? Somebody say it out loud. Eternal life, eternal life. And he says, they'll never perish, and no one can take them out of my hand. That's your security if you're a follower of Christ. That's my security. I am here. My time is in God's hands. I am indestructible until he's finished with me. I mean, I still have to be wise. I have to live intelligently, of course. But I also have eternal life no one can take from me. Let me go further. What I've learned through God's word and through experience in life, there is no pain, there is no circumstance, there is no heartbreak, there is no loss, there is no catastrophe that can occur in your life, no heartbreak, but that Christ is more than adequate more than adequate to get you through I'm talking to somebody who all their life long they have been tortured with insecurity they are always fearful of being abandoned they are always afraid to love they are always afraid to give themselves they are always afraid that the knife in the back is coming and I'm telling you the answer to insecurity is to know that Christ is with you he's for you he'll never leave you and forsake you and I don't care what life and human beings do to you I know this by experience 
He is more than adequate to bring you through it, to heal your heart, to heal your soul, and he will literally fill you with compassion that you didn't have before, expand your capacity to love God and love people, and to be more tender-hearted rather than bitter and hateful if you'll let him. So you see, my significance and my security and my satisfaction, Jesus promises me in this life, I'll be satisfied as I develop spiritually, inwardly, but he promises me I'll be satisfied with perfect the desires of my heart in eternity forevermore. So the two are suitors, the two are competitors. Money says, I'll satisfy you right now. I'll give you what you want, when you want, how you want it. Jesus says, no, 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 I'll satisfy you forever, but not in this place that's riddled by sickness, sorrow, crime, and war, and prejudice, and hatred, and pain, and death. He says, no, I'm allowing evil for a little while so that I can abolish it forever, but if you trust me, the desires of your heart are going to be met, not just for time, but for eternity. So all this is wrapped up. Jesus says money will pull at you because money can give you a sense of significance now it can give you security now it can give you satisfaction now immediate gratification and so it pulls us away from worship of God into worship and it does it sometimes without us even knowing it we, we, we don't know that we've misplaced our trust in persons places things or money in particular so sometimes it's all about misplaced trust. I'm, I'm speaking to you now very personally. Some of us in here today might be having financial struggles because the truth be told, you've misplaced your trust. It's not that you don't trust Christ. You just have not trusted in him perhaps deeply enough entirely so that your trust is kind of divided and that's creating the tension and the fear and the worry and God wants you today to settle this issue, purify your trust, and place it completely in Christ. Heard about this lady, her name is Sylvia Bloom. Uh, Sylvia Bloom lived to be 96 years old. I got a picture of her, I think. Let's see, where, where, where do we got Sylvia? Oh, 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 I should read this verse. This is critical. Philippians 4, 19, the Apostle Paul writing to followers of Christ living in Philippi. He says, and my God will meet all your, what is the word? Needs. Needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Here's God's promise. He's saying, relax. Your business went under. Relax. You lost your career. Relax. You see, Randy, that's a stupid thing to expect of someone. What's your option? Does worry do any good? Does it help to worry? If it helps, go ahead and worry. You know? My God will supply all our, what's the word? Wants. Does it say all your wants? No. All your needs. You say, well, blah, 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 blah. how does he define needs? I'm going to show you later on. You've got to wait. Wait later on the message. Let me go to this, this story now. I'll show you this picture. So here's this lady, uh, Sylvia Bloom. She died at age 96 in 2016. So what's unique about Sylvia Bloom? Well, here's what's unique about her. She worked as a secretary in New York City for 67 years. 67 years. She rode the subway back and forth. 67 years, she lived in a, a very modest apartment with her husband. It was a rental control apartment. 67 years, she lived pretty much what we would call a, a life of not poverty, but darn close to it. I mean, she just didn't, you know, she just lived very, very simple. When Sylvia Bloom died in 2016 at age 96, they found that Sylvia Bloom had $9 million. $9 million. She had been a millionaire for decades. Her husband didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah. Her husband. He died in 2002. My man never knew that she had a penny. <laughs> Living in the same dumpy little apartment. She never gave a penny, as far as we, we know, to the cause of Christ. She never did anything to help anybody. Evidently, she was so darn afraid that she would run out. You know, that rainy day, man, that rainy day, you got to have something up for that rainy day. And evidently, she was so worried about the rainy, rainy day that she just let the millions pile up. You say, Randy, how did she get all that money? 
Well, these, these people she worked for, she was a secretary for her. <laughs> it's a really funny story. They would have her at times buy stock for them. They would say, you know, I want you to buy me this, this amount of stock today. Well, she'd take that little bit of money she had in her salary, and she'd buy a little bit of the stock they were buying because she figured they're rich, so I'll buy what they buy. Sure enough, it worked. It worked. She never enjoyed a penny of it. But that's not the issue. For me, anyway, she, as far, I'm not trying to be mean, but Sylvia Bloom, as far as I know, has nothing to look forward to in eternity. There was no indication that she ever darkened the, the doorstep of a church, that she ever trusted Christ, that she ever gave to the cause of Christ. She had it all now and never even used it because she was so scared, so insecure, so tortured by not having enough. Nine million dollars. And she died. And the moral of the story is, don't be that person. <laughs> don't be that person. Misplaced trust. Let me show you the second cause of financial struggle, unnecessary financial struggle. We need to sometimes recognize and replace mistaken belief. Sometimes we struggle financially because we have mistaken belief about life. I'm going to show you a portion of Scripture that's, that's just incredible. When, when I was reading over this again, and I've, I've read it so many times in my life, but this time I kind of put myself in the whole feel of the audience of the thing. Here it is. Let me, let me read it to you. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said to them, this is Jesus. Jesus, you know, he, he's teaching people. Imagine this. You've got, you got, to, got to fathom what's happening here. The creator of the universe is down on his planet that he created. He is teaching human beings for the first time with this accuracy the truth about God and the truth about life, the most valuable information that human beings could ever have. He is offering himself in grace and love to human beings. And so what happens to yokels in the crowd are fussing about money between themselves. So, so that's the background of this portion of Scripture. These guys yell out. Imagine as Jesus is teaching. They yell out, Master, my brother is fighting with me, arguing with me about who, who's going to get what share of the inheritance. How many of you ever argue with your relatives over share of an inheritance? No, I don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to know. You wouldn't do that. Uh, anyway. These guys yell out. They interrupt Jesus, God, the creator of the universe. I mean, they're oblivious to what's happening and what's being offered them. They yell out, Master, straighten up my brother to be fair about this inheritance. And Jesus answers. He said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Weird word. Greek word, pleonakia. It, it, it means, I just want a little more. That's what covetous means. I just want more than what I have. How many of you remember in Exodus 20, 17? What's the last commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Yeah. It's a really interesting commandment. God says, don't, 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 don't want more than what you have. It's not saying that you can't get more at some time, but, but, but don't, don't let this thing get on your mind. Don't, don't let it get in your heart. There's strong indication that the very first sin, the sin committed by Lucifer, was because he was covetous. He wanted more than what God was willing to give him. Anyway, not another message, another time. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, all wanting more than what you have. For one's life, now here's the key. Jesus is about to unload a powerful teaching here. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's a common misbelief. It's a very popular belief in our society today that, that our life, what does he mean life? Jesus is saying the best life possible. Every human being is pursuing the best life possible. We, 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 we call it, we might say, man, all I want to do is be happy. I'm just, I just want, I'm pursuing happiness. Pursuit of happiness, American right, right? The best life possible. Jesus is saying the best life possible, it, it's not about how, how many possessions you have. He's saying that, that's, not, that's not the key to experiencing the best life possible. I, I, I drew a little something out. Let, let me share this with you. Approach to the best life possible. The popular approach, the vast majority of human beings that are alive today that have ever lived, this is, 
This is what we believe. It's a mistaken belief, but this is what has been popularly believed. It's the basis of every TV commercial and, and every product that's you know, trying to be sold. Nothing wrong with selling a product. But anyway, approach to the best life possible. Prosperity, meaning money, wealth. I need to get lots and lots of money. The more money, the more I'm going to have the best life possible. And with the wealth, I can have possessions and then try to get some popularity. You know, get, get, get a lot of people that know you, that like you. And then get some power, get some influence, control some stuff. The more control, the more best life possible you're going to experience. And then load your life with pleasures. Try it. If it's available, try it. See if you like it. The more you can do it. And here's what this philosophy looks like. It's the best life possible I get what I want as much as I want whenever I want it however I want it now some of this might be offensive to you but I guarantee you, if you're honest and you look back in your life maybe even now without being fully aware of it this is a driving governing philosophy and it will cause you and I to become very restless and very worried about finances and we will have struggles when they are absolutely unnecessary this is the majority of people's base baseline of of what we believe will bring the best life possible I just want what I want as much as I want whenever I want it however I want it and Jesus says that's a total fallacy now if it's in your heart in your mind in your life you've got to sift it out you've got to recognize it before you can replace it it's just like tires how many of you ever ever you know you walked up on your tire one day and you see that thing man it's all worn down all weird on one side and you've been driving it you didn't know that all your tires look like they're they're bald need replacing how many have ever had that it just kind of sneaks up on you I'm the only fool I guess but it has happened to me <laughs> but once you recognize it you know it needs to be replaced you and I must be able to recognize is this thing is this philosophy in me and I didn't know it and it's what's making me so stupid in the way that I live and so restless about finances and I pursue things that I shouldn't even be pursuing and I worry about stuff that I shouldn't even be worrying about we need to ask ourselves these questions now Jesus he locked in on this and he goes on in that passage when those two yokels yelled out about divide the inheritance he then tells a parable to put them in their place but more to enlighten them and if you've read the passage in Luke the parable is about this guy that's really really wealthy and so he he has all this money that just came flooding in and he says wow man what am I going to do I got all this money all I know what I'll do I'll, I'll build extra buildings and extra barns and I'll stockpile money so that I can just lay back and have it easy breezy for the rest of my days this is in the parable in Luke chapter 12 I want you to see what God says to the man in the parable Luke 12 20 but God said to him you what is the word you don't want God calling you a fool I, I, I mean this is the one that loves us more than anyone else has the capacity to when God calls us a fool it is the greatest of tragedies it is an unnecessary tragedy this man that amassed all this wealth and he was stockpiling it and just saying man I, I can retire now I can just take it easy he says you fool you will die this very night then who will get everything you work for yes a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a what does it say rich relationship with God now, now, he didn't say that it's a fool to be wealthy. I'm going to just say something that's going to offend the daylights out of some of you. Here's the historical truth. Look at it. It's in the Bible. God chooses all through history for some people to be wealthy. Some of his best people have been wealthy people. Abraham was a wealthy guy. There was nothing, there was nothing wrong with wealth. Some of the most generous kingdom serving people alive are wealthy people there's nothing wrong with wealth it, it, it's what we do to wealth and let me rephrase that it's what the wealth does to us because that's usually the most difficult thing for us to handle but some people do it and handle it with beauty so please don't misunderstand what i'm saying here when he calls this guy a fool 
It wasn't because he was wealthy. It was because he ignored God. And, and essentially, he's suddenly swept into an eternity that he's utterly unequipped for. And so Jesus is emphasizing the importance of a relationship with God as opposed to the worldly wealth. Let me go on to something again. 1 Timothy 6. Now, I told you earlier, what are, how does God see what we need? Okay, I said we would get specific, so here it is. 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with, what is that word? Contentment. In this life, God calls us to learn contentment. He promises us the desires of our heart for eternity. You can't get the desires of your heart in this life anyway. I hope, you, I hope everybody in this room is wise enough to know that by now. You want more than you can ever get in this life. Don't feel bad or guilty about it. That's put in you by God because it's meant to draw us to heaven where we can have the full desires of our heart. Godliness with contentment. In this life, we have to learn contentment. So it means I'm going to be satisfied with less than my heart's desire in this life. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be, what is that word? Say it out loud. Content with that. No, you won't. <laughs> no, we won't. We're Americans. Do, do you know that... That the twenty percent that, that the the twenty percent poorest people, Pete just shared this with me earlier this morning. Twenty percent of the poorest people in this country, the poorest, let me say it again, the poorest twenty percent of Americans are wealthier than the wealthiest European people, have more goods, have more services per per scale are wealthier how many of you know it's really really hard to, to starve to death in america it's really really hard. you almost have to try you almost have to want to starve to death in america to starve to death homeless population homeless population or homelessness problem is a terrible problem horrible should be remedied in this country can be remedied should be and can be how, how many i'm just curious how many people do you think are homeless in the united states so you got, you got like 330 million Americans. How, how many people do you think are homeless in the United States? What, what percentage, I'll put it like that, what percentage of Americans are homeless? Anybody give a wild gander? 10%? Anybody else? Eight? Somebody say 25, did I hear? 35%. No, 0.2%. Not even, not even 5%. 0.2%. Two percent. There's about 500,000, almost 600,000 homeless people. Of the homeless population in the United States, half of them are sheltered homeless. In other words, they, they go to a place where they have a roof over their head, they have food given to them, they have electricity, they have running water. Now, you, Randy, you've never been in those shelters, man. You don't know how bad it is. I know, I know it, it, it could be bad. But, but it's, better, it's better than anybody that was alive in Jesus' day. How many of you know that, that Caesar himself couldn't flip a switch and make lights go on? Yeah. Caesar didn't have a refrigerator. C C Caesar couldn't order a sandwich at a shop somewhere. I I'm, I'm just trying to put things in perspective because we'll torture ourselves and we'll envy things and we'll want things that through most of human history, people couldn't even get but we have them in lavish body. So you, you, food and clothing, learn to be content with that. Everything over food and clothing, it's like, wow, wow, we're so blessed. I don't even understand why we're so blessed. That's the way we ought to be thinking. Let's go on. Philippians 4.11. Now, God wants to help us to learn to be content because we're not content. We still got heaven on our mind. We want the full desires of our heart. You can't get the full desires of your heart in this life. Therefore, contentment is hard for us, so God enters in to help us to learn to be content. Philippians 4, Paul says, I have learned, notice he, it was a process, I have learned to be content What? Ever the circumstances even financial setbacks struggles I know what it is to be what did he say in need and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want 
I can do all this through him, meaning Christ, who gives me strength. Do you want to know how God teaches us to be content? How he helps us to learn to be content? Same way he taught Paul. Paul said, I know what it is to be, what is the word? In need. The way God helps us to learn to be content is he puts us in situations and circumstances at times in our life where we don't have what we want. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but you might be in one of those seasons right now where you don't have what you want. Did you ever consider that God is lovingly teaching you? He wants you to go without some things you want so that in this life you can learn to be content. Now, others of us, we have an abundance. Paul said, he said, I know what it is to have plenty. Some of us have plenty. We have an abundance, and God's trying to teach us as well. Okay, you've got that abundance, but don't get too attached to it. Because one bad doctor report, one accident, one crime, one war, one catastrophe in nature can take it all away. I don't wish ill on anybody, but we all should know that. We all should be mature. We all should live that way. Our security is in Christ alone. It is not in what we pile up or what we've built because it can all be swept away. And I'm not diminishing anybody in here's hard work and wise investment efforts. I would never disrespect that unless you're leaving God out of that equation. Then I would call you a fool. Not to your face, of course. I let God call you a fool to your face. <laughs> He says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So God's helping us. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to help us to learn to be content. So here's what I'm trying to say. Some of us might be having a financial struggle because we're worried that we're not going to be able to live the lifestyle that we once lived before COVID and before the job loss and the career loss and the business loss or whatever it is, or, or the skill loss. I don't know. It could be, or the, the age loss, you know, whatever it is. Maybe it be a physical health problem. And so we're worried. We're worried. We're upset. We're struggling. We're struggling. We're, we're, we're just miserable. And God's saying, you just got to learn. I, I'm trying to teach you. I, I'm I'm spending special time to teach you to learn to be content. And Paul says, man, I, I learned it. I learned it. And you become fearless. You become fearless when you learn this. It's just like I said earlier, you become fearless when you know that no matter what pain life delves out to you, Christ is more than competent to heal you and bring you back from the ashes once you know that and internalize that you become a lot bolder a lot less fearful in life so it is with this when you learn that life the best life possible it's inward it has very little to do with the external circumstances that's what jesus was trying to tell those guys it's about being rich in your relationship with god it's about seeing things from God's perspective. That's the key to life. It's inward. It's not outward. We can learn to be content. That diminishes the worries. It diminishes the turmoil. It diminishes the tension, the frustration, the anger, the depression about financial changes that may occur. So let me close with this. Here's the approach to the best life possible in this world that God gives to us from his word pursue godliness become a person that lives their life centered in Christ and every day you're seeking to expand his kingdom and to become more righteous in behavior in character like him that's the secret you'll find love and joy and peace growing inside you regardless of your circumstances You'll find purpose for every day, meaning in everything. Every circumstance has meaning. You will not be tortured by feeling that you have no worth. You will know that you have significance. Christ created me. He died for me. I know my worth. You can't take it from me. I don't have to run any faster, jump any higher. That's the way God wants you to live. You know your significance. You know your security is in Christ. And the satisfaction, he'll provide what I need in this life as long as I need it, and he'll give me the desires of my heart forevermore in eternity. I have hope that nothing in this life can take away from me because 
My hope goes on the other side in a different dimension. It's in heaven. It's a certainty. Christ rose from the grave. He made it certain that it's there for us. So here's what it looks like in a working relationship. Instead of what I want, it's what Christ wants, as much as Christ wants, whenever Christ wants, however Christ wants. Now I want to contrast the two. Go to that slide. Here's the two, the two ways, the approaches to the best life possible. You've got to figure out, you've got to figure out for yourself which one is really ruling and reigning in your heart. What Christ wants, as much as Christ wants. In other words, I'm only going to have as much money at any point in my life as Christ wants me to have, and I accept that. Whenever Christ wants, when he wants me to, like Paul said, to be in need, I'm going to be in need, and I'm going to trust him. When he wants me to have plenty, I'll have plenty. However Christ wants, contrast the governing philosophy of most people, what I want, as much as I want, whenever I want it, however I want it. I'm going to tell you something I know. If this is, if this is what's actually governing within us, Man, we'll be such fragile people. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be upset by nearly anything. We will struggle financially throughout life, and we will just feel like the weight of the world is always on us, particularly any time an economic change occurs or a career change or a health change. So when we leave here today, we all have an opportunity. Some of us have learned I need to recognize I've been misplacing my trust and, and, and I, I need to change that. I, I, I need to replace my trust in money with my trust in God. I need to replace my trust in myself to my trust in God. I, I, I need to replace my belief that the best life possible is me getting what I want, when I want it, as much as I want, however I want it. I've, I've, I've got to root that out. I see that's a lie. That's deceiving me. That's causing me unnecessary torture, torment, turmoil, tension, stress, depression. And I'm going to change this thing. No, 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 no. This life is about what Christ wants as much as he wants, when he wants, how he wants. I'm going to replace that misbelief because I believe that's the key to the best life possible the best life possible in this world I'm just going to ask you how many of you want the best life possible even in this short life can I see your hands you now know how to have it a loving God offers it up to each of us again this day starts with putting your trust in Christ and becoming his follower if you've never done that man I hope you do that before you leave here today I did it at age 23 and I've I've never never ever regretted that the only thing I've ever regretted in life are the times when me and my stupidity and stubbornness would not do God's will but never have I regretted doing his will and you will always be glad you did as well let's pray Father, you know us, you know our hearts, you know our confusion, you know where we need to uh, recognize and replace, whether it's trust or belief. May your spirit help us to fight through these things that financial stress, financial pressure, financial struggles might literally become a thing of the past. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Do you stand to your feet before we go from this place?